bit about GSS API first. And then we'll go through an introduction to GSS Proxy and its components and what we use it for, which is uh, we will use it for kernel of calls, actual privilege separation, and also additional features like automatic crash or handling. So let me introduce a bit GSS API. May I ask a question? How many of you know what is GSS API? Ah, quite a few. Okay, um, so GSS API stands for G Generic Security Service API, and it is basically an abstraction layer initially introduced to simplify the use of Kerberos. Um, however, GSS API is really an abstraction. It, it's not tied to Kerberos in any way whatsoever. It's uh, a tool for building secure connections between uh, two processes over a network and is um, uh, it is meant to be usable with multiple authentication protocols and to be able at the end of the authentication set up a second channel between two applications with um, integrity and confidentiality. Integrity is uh, authentication of the messages signing, also called in some network protocols, and confidentiality is encryption also called sealing in some protocols. And the underlying protocol can provide additional capabilities like delegation, which is something we use with Kerberos. And GSS API is also analogous and compatible with the Windows SSPI, which is the Windows side of uh, APIs used to connect and create secret channels. So, uh, an example of applications that use GSS API, um, usually called single sign-on, um, and usually through Kerberos, which is uh, the most known uh, method you can use GSS API, are protocols like LDAP, IMAP, or even SMTP. Um, these protocols usually don't use GSS API directly. Uh, they use GSS API through SASL, uh, which is Simple Authentication and Security Layer, which is another abstraction uh, you can use. And the reason why these protocols use this different abstraction is that historically these two uh, abstractions basically almost started at the same time and were uh, ratified in various um, uh, um, standardization bodies. Uh, and then a bridge was built between SASL and GSS API to use both together. Um, they have slightly different properties, and I'm not going to into SASL. Um, GSS API directly is used in other protocols, like for example, uh, SSH, which we just saw. Um, the GSS, GSS API supported SSH, I don't think is completely upstream. Uh, it's kind of a mixed bag of patches on top for some of the features. Um, it would be nice to see a bit more uh, integration there, but so far what we have in the distributions is sufficient. Um, another protocols again, like HTTPS, you can find GSS API usually called as SPNego, and <coughs> this is uh, a way to do authentication only. In this case, GSS API is not used for confidentiality or integrity. Uh, in the HTTP case, uh, those properties are provided by SSL, and GSS API is used only as a way to provide Kerberos and, in the Microsoft case, NTLM SS3 support for authentication. Um, <coughs> other protocols uh, are like NFS. NFS uses uh, an authentication protocol called RPC GSS. Uh, also known as EchoNFS, and that's also a use of GSS API uh, directly. In the specific case of NFS, the only method supported within GSS API is the Kerberify method. There is no support <coughs> for selecting a different method there. So, how do we use GSS API? GSS API, uh, 
in itself is a broad API, not overly broad, but there are very few steps that are really uh, important for adding use of JS API. Uh, the first one is the acquisition of credentials, which is not <coughs> very explicit. Generally, what happened with JS API is that uh, the whole this API architecture assumes that a set of credentials are somehow available. And, and this is somehow is vague because each authentication protocol has different methods to set up uh, credentials. In the Kerberos case, for example, the way you set up credentials for a user is by using the Knit uh, tool or in any case, any other process that can do an AES request. And then when you use JS API, uh, the API itself just assumes that the underlying method, Kerberos, knows where to find user credentials. Um, and the same is valid for any other JS API protocol. Um, how it is done in practice is that usually, at least with Kerberos, uh, there are defaults, or you can set environment variables that point uh, the actual underlying mechanism to the right place where to find credentials. The second important phase is uh, the establishment of a security context. This is actually the uh, buildup of the channel between two applications. Um, it's done through two simple calls, one from the client side, just as init set context, and the other from server side is the accept set context. Um, this a pair of calls, basically, from the point of view of an application, just pass messages that are completely opaque to the application from a client and a server until both return a successful error code. If success is returned, then you have a handle that, is a, that represents a security context, and you know that any further use means that the communication between the two uh, peers is protected. Uh, so once you have the security context, you can start passing messages. Um, and one of the simplest functions you can use is just as wrap and unwrap pair. Uh, wrap just encrypts and authenticate the message. Then you can send it and unwrap unwraps it. Um, just to say API by itself does not do any network communication. Uh, it just gives uh, the tokens to an application. An application is actually um, in charge of passing the message, the raw messages. <clears throat> and at the end, there is the disposal security context, uh, which destroy uh, any session key and any uh, material that could be used to encrypt or unencrypt communication. So this is a simple um, uh, diagram of what happened between two processes, a client and a server. Um, if you can, if you see at the client, there is step 1C between kind of quotes, acquire cre uh, credentials, uh, kind of indefined, depends on the method. Um, the next step you do is you import a name. Uh, names are a very complex subject in just API. Uh, I had to really understand how it works, and I don't want to explain it. Uh, just suffice to note, it's much more than a name in a GSS API name. And, uh, but for the very basic use, uh, for the user, what they represent usually is a target. So when you uh, want to contact a server, you import the name of the server so that GSS API knows uh, how to deal with the peer on the other side. Uh, when using Kerberos method, what these implies is that as soon as you import the name, uh, the um, GSS API knows how to request the ticket using your credentials for the right server. So uh, passing the correct <laughs> server name is fundamental to be able to get uh, Kerberos communication established between the two peers because if you don't pass the right name with the right canonicalization, uh, you might not be able to get the ticket to communicate. <coughs> and so very important step there. And the very next one is initialization of the context. Uh, this function prefers you know, the context and 
uh, returns to the application a, a token, uh, which in the Kerberos case is usually uh, a ticket wrap, just a little bit with some mechanism, and that token is sent to the server. Uh, this, the how it's sent depends on the application. So it's just a binary blob. You get the length and this uh, message, and you send it. <coughs> on the other side, the application needs to know what credentials to use again. Uh, in the Kerberos case, is a, usually a key tab. Um, and then in accept this context, uh, depending on the protocol, it might be sufficient uh, to accept the context to establish the communication. In some other protocols, uh, the server may need to send back another message to the application, and there is no uh, predefined number of message exchanges that are needed for uh, establishing a context. So uh, the application just need to, co to keep sending and receiving messages until both ends are happy or an error is returned. In the Kerberos case, usually you don't need more than one round trip. Uh, in other, with other mechanisms, like for example in TLMSSP, uh, you might need three or more uh, round trips, uh, and when SPNEGO is also in the mix, you might need one more, and there are other cases as well. So really, there's no, you, you cannot predict from an application, if you want to make a very generic application, you cannot predict how many trips are going to be, you just need to keep passing. And once that is done, basically you have an authentication uh, succeeded and the context established, then you just send and receive encrypted payload. And the way it does, you do it is that you take your plain text message, you give it to a wrapping function, it will give you back a buffer that you send to the application, that, and then again the other application passes to unwrap, it unwraps it, it gives you back plain text. And, and that's it. So it's, it's, the conceptually is very simple and you don't have to use many of the GS API functions to do the very basic uh, stuff. So, to the actually interesting topic. Uh, why a GSS proxy? Mm. So standard GSS API assumes that both the client and the server application, as I showed before, have direct access to credentials and to uh, keys. And this may be a problem in some cases. Uh, uh, it was an interesting talk before mine about SSH and pre-digital separation there, which explained also the problem is that we have network facing applications and bugs can happen and that might mean that application can be more easily compromised and if you have direct access to key material it means that the application may get access to keys and do nasty things. Uh, so uh, GSS proxy allows you to basically separate the application from the access to key material. Uh, so that if an application is compromised, you don't get access to the key material. Um, another reason why we build GSS proxy is that also uh, GSS API is, is used in the kernel, uh, specifically in the NFS server and client uh, modules. Uh, however, GSS API in itself is a very big library and it cannot be easily fit into the kernel. Uh, it's, it's complex enough uh, that kernel developers are really not comfortable putting all that code in the kernel, even a subset. Um, and so, but by using just as proxy, uh, we can basically let the kernel do what it needs, but keep all the GIST API processing in user space. Uh, this is not new, the kernel already does that, but just as proxy does it with, a, with an IPC method is slightly better than what we have now. Mm. And there's also potential in the future, uh, this is just on paper, we'll not put any resource on that, but uh, it's something interesting for developing a sort of SSH agent. Um, if you're using SSH keys, you know that you can run an SSH agent so that when you jump through hosts, uh, you can keep your key material on your own machine and basically SSH will pass messages through the agent to perform authentication. Um, when you use GSS API uh, with SSH, instead normally what happens is that uh, your um, TGT, which is basically your 
token that allows you to take tickets for any service is delegated to the target host so that once you get there, you can keep doing uh, additional work and connecting to other hosts using single, single sign-on without having to type password, et cetera. Um, however, <coughs> this means that every time you SSH into a host and you delegate fully your ticket, uh, that host has full access uh, to any other host with your own credentials. Uh, and it has direct access to the actual session key in your, uh, in, in your tickets and, and everything. Uh, the idea would be that well, with a GSS proxy, you could actually proxy any access from the target host to SSH back to your own machine. And so basically what we've seen before, just between multiple hosts. Um, this would require quite some change in SSH, uh, I guess. So it's not something we're looking for, but it's an interesting possibility to increase the security of your own credentials in the future. Uh, so how, how does this proxy work? So this proxy is really three things. Uh, it's a daemon that runs on the machine. Uh, at least it's on a Unix socket. And it's basically a very a stateless machine, even driven. Any operation doesn't require any state. Uh, it's also a mechanist plugin. Um, it's basically a shared object that you load into the GS API library. And we've, we've uh, worked with MIT to make sure that this new mechanism uh, was, uh, which is called interposer mechanism, was able to basically uh, interpose any existing GS API mechanism and intercept any communication between the application and the final mechanism within GS API so that any communication can be grabbed by the GSS proxy through the Unix socket where the daemon is listening and pass messages to a different process. Mm. And the third part is the actual communication protocol, which is uh, the fundamental part of it. Uh, it's a next year based RPC protocol. The reason why we choose this sometimes ancient, considered ancient protocol is that it was the common denominator we could find everywhere, including in the kernel, which was one of the targets of GSS proxy. Uh, XDR is quite simple. There is uh, the uh, libRPC or libtrpc library, depending on the implementation. Uh, originally also available in glibc. And basically, it uh, includes a number of operations that are analogous to what you find in GSS API. Um, however, what we've done with the protocol is that we try to compound uh, um, the calls into a, a slightly reduced number of operations um, in order to avoid latency. Because we are introducing a socket communication between uh, what normally is just a function call in an application. And we didn't want to do too many round trips uh, as I said before, uh, beyond the very basic GIS API functions, there are a number of other functions you can use uh, to do all sorts of things, uh, request information about uh, uh, the actual established channel uh, or play with names. And we wanted to make sure that every time you call GIS API, unless there has to be communication, you would find all the information already available uh, in the application without an external um, uh, call to a, to a different process. <coughs> so coming to previous separation, um, why we did that, I explained to avoid access to key material. Um, and the, the, the most important case for us is to be able to avoid access to key tabs. Key tabs are just uh, in the Kerberos uh, case just little files where you have a shared secret between your machine and the KDC. That's that's it. It's very it's analogous to a password, except that normally in KeyTabs keys are completely random, so uh, they're usually a little bit stronger than normal passwords that are limited to a uh, common character set. Um, and if you have access to the KeyTab, you can impersonate, uh, especially the so-called host KeyTab, which uh, 
has a key for uh, the host principle, you can do basically anything as that machine, including intercepting, for example, SSH communication, if done to a GIS API, because SSH uses the host key. And so what we did with GSS Prox <coughs> is that <coughs> when the application uh, calls GSS API to accept communication, instead of accessing directly uh, the key tab, it goes through GSS Proxy. And this is uh, a small schematic of that, how that happens. Um, so I showed before that, uh, let me go back here. As you hear, I don't show anything else beyond the two applications on the client and the server. And in step two on the server, I show a quiet credential, which basically directly go and takes a key tab and does all the crypto. However, when GSS proxy in the mix, there is an additional step, and that happens in the, in the yellow blob called libgsapi API plus, plus proxy mech. It shows that there is no direct access to the key tab anymore, but that uh, proxy mech start talking with the GSS proxy, which is a separate process on the machine, and that pro uh, process is the only one that has direct access to the key tab. So basically every time you send a message between the client and the server, Again, the message is relayed to the GSS proxy that does the actual context establishment. Um, and this is the most time consuming or the place where there's the actual slowdown. To avoid the slowdown to continue during the actual uh, application life, once the, the context is established, the GSS proxy sends, exports the context in a form that can be imported back in the original application, and there it is re-imported there. Uh, this is completely transparent in the application. The application doesn't see anything. What the application see is just that the GSS, GSS API accepts a context function, returns OK, and gives back uh, a context which is just a pointer in C. And what that, what that means within the proxy Mac uh, layer is that the context is re-imported in the application and proxy max switches between the mode where it sends all the communication to the GSS proxy daemon to reusing the local mechanism. Uh, and so basically, it uses the session key that is derived between, from the uh, context establishment to do all the encryption and authentication of messages between those applications without the need to go outside the GSS proxy to do any of that. Uh, this is uh, fine and, and, and doesn't expose credentials to a process because the session key is derived from credentials. It doesn't use the actual uh, long-term key. And so exporting a context is perfectly fine because uh, the session key is limited to the specific connection between the two applications. So uh, kernel of call is the other case. Um, um, when we started thinking about this GSS proxy uh, daemon, we uh, were also at the same time contacted by the NFS, some NFS people, about uh, helping out with solving one little problem in NFSD. And the little problem is that, unfortunately, because of the way NFSD was built many years ago, uh, the NFS server was not able to deal uh, with the R RPC GSS protocol when Kerberos tickets were large. And by large, I mean roughly more than two kilobytes of data. And that's because they use a very, very simple upcall method. And the upcall method in the kernel is a way to pass data from the kernel to a user space application outside of the classic read, write file operation because it's kernel initiated. And this very simple protocol used a single memory page, uh, which is normally four kilobytes in size. However, not happy with that limitation, they also basically uh, base 64 in code. I think base 64, but anyway, they turn any binary blob into an ASCII string. And so the actual amount of data you can send 
is a, just a little bit more than two kilobytes. And this is fine um, with, you know, classic Kerberos uh, infrastructure, but when you put Active Directory in the mix, uh, where Active Directory attaches authorization information to Kerberos tickets, uh, the Kerberos ticket can grow up to 65 kilobytes of, of si in size in some cases. And there was simply no way to pass that information back to user space. So the NFS server right now uh, simply fails to do any authentication when it receives such a large ticket. You simply get an error. And so we were asked to help resolving this problem and we thought that we had a way to do that through the GSS proxy because in the GSS proxy uh, we built this new protocol which is RPC based and we built actual patches. Um, we basically reused uh, local RPC using a Unix socket from the kernel uh, to communicate the GSS proxy. Uh, and the communication is exactly the same as it happens between the proxy uh, mechanism within GSS API, uh, except that it u the, the kernel uses the raw protocol directly. So the kernel uh, actually understands the underlying protocol. Uh, so it's not transparent like it is for user space applications. Um, and at the end of the communication, um, in the, in the, uh, sorry, in the kernel, what happens is that the kernel gets back a, a reduced a context called a lucid context and a set of users credentials uh, and the users a set of users credentials are nothing more than uh, the UID and the set of JDs of the user that was actually authenticated um, and the communication uh, mechanism is exactly uh, very similar to what you see in, in the uh, um, privilege separation case except that in this case you have the bottom uh, a kernel thread, usually a kind of component that does the communication and does exactly the same operations as a normal application plus as, an, as a special extension just for the kernel, we add, um, when we export the context from GSS proxy to the kernel, we export the lucid context which is much smaller than what you use in the user space because it contains exclusively the session key and some information about encryption type in the case of Kerberos. And we attach another bit of data that is not usually sent in the normal uh, bridge separation case, which is uh, UID and JDs of the user that actually authenticated through. Uh, once you get the lucid context, it means that the user was really authenticated. It means you have credentials and NFS can start operating against the file system using those credentials to access files. And so basically the NFS server now can uh, respect access control list and on everything else. Um, it's really not much different from free separation but allows us to use basically any size of tickets because we switch from this custom of call mechanism limited to four kilobytes to a Unix socket communication, so just local RPC. And the size right now is limited uh, to one megabyte, I think one megabyte per message. Uh, that's not a, it's not a technical limitation in the product, it's just that we decided to limit the size of the buffers to something that was reasonable uh, for the kernel. Um, final um, uh, feature that we added actually after, or we are still, we're actually still adding into GSS proxy, uh, but after the kernel stuff was done, um, is automatic credential handling. Um, for the, again, for, for secure, uh, secure NFS is, uh, is working beneath the application level layer. Uh, usually applications are, n are not or should, or I don't know if they should not be, but they are not av uh, aware of what kind of file system is beneath them. They just call open read write operations. However, in the, in the NFS case, if you want to use secure NFS, uh, the application 
need to have some sort of credentials, and that those are Kerberos credentials, in order for the NFS uh, connections to be established to the server on the other side. Um, and it's a big problem for unattended applications like daemons because normally those applications don't have a credential cache available. It's not uh, an interactive session where a user logged in or did a key in it manually to create a credential cache that then the applications that run within the user context can use, including the NFS client in kernel. And so there is a sort of a problem where you want to use secure NFS for these applications, but these applications have no credential, and so the NFS client has nothing to use to establish a secure connection to the server. Um, and what came out is this, which seems like another incarnation of the previous slide, just slightly modified. In this case, user's proxy is used on the client side rather than on the server. And what happens is that when an NFS client tries to establish a connection <coughs> to the server on the other side, it again uses GSS API to try and create an, a context. So it calls any set context. Right before doing that, the user space component normally used to troll the TMP on the client to find user credentials to use for the user. Uh, it would just go in TMP and search any a file called kerbify.cc under bar UID. And the UID is a UID number of the user. Trying to find a credential cache belonging to the user trying to do the operation. And if it couldn't find a credential, it would just fail before even attempting communication with the server on the other side. Uh, with GSS proxy, what we can do though is that when, in, when a quiet credential is called, instead of trying to go and troll the TMP in hope to find a credential cache, uh, we can actually intercept the call from the GSS proxy and see if there is a special user key tab in a location on the machine that is uh, related to the user ID making the, the call. Now at that point, we can use the key tab to initiate, uh, to do a K in it basically, using the key tab, get credentials, and then use those credentials to establish a context. What this means is that the application doesn't need to know, like, right, like it should be, that underneath we're using uh, a secure protocol or the file system is not local. Uh, it just or does a normal open operation on a path and the system can figure out how to create a credential in its own without having to involve the application or without having admins trying to create cron jobs to keep the credentials fresh or having to um, uh, uh, wrap uh, startup of these demons with uh, things like a 5 star which are applications that just take a key tab and keep reinitiating credentials. Uh, this also means that you don't uh, grab credentials for this application until the application actually need to communicate with the server. So it's basically done on demand. And it seems like a very cool feature. We get a number of requests from customers already as well. So uh, this is almost done. Um, we are not quite there yet, uh, but in a couple of days should be into Jesus Proxy. Yep. So, question. So, if you go back to your previous slide, and the one worry I have here, so, so there are caches pending to do swapping over NFS, things mm -hmm. like that. And I wonder if we have to do anything to, to like memlock or, or protect the user space components so you don't get into a deadlock. Um, that's a good question. So, yes, there is. There is a problem there. Uh, I don't think you can safely use this method um, for something like swap, because if you're using it for swap, it means that the kernel is under memory pressure. And almost certainly, uh, both the key tab and the whole GSS proxy process has been swapped already, <laughs> or 
should be swapped or anyway, if it tries to allocate any memory, it will probably fail. <coughs> and however, this is unsol an unsolvable problem. The only way you could solve this is either pin the whole JSS proxy in every key tab and C cache files in the kernel memory, uh, or you move everything into the kernel. You, you could try to pin, I mean, the JSS proxy itself, once it is started, um, doesn't use incredibly amounts of memory. However, it does dynamically allocate memory because that's what GSS API does. And within GSS, GSS proxy, we reuse GSS API itself. We haven't re-implemented the whole mechanisms or the whole GSS API. We just proxy the communication from the client to the GSS proxy daemon. And within GSS proxy, we just reuse GSS API. The only thing we do is that we don't loop back into ourselves. <laughs> that's the only thing we try to avoid. However, there is a there is a certain amount of memory allocation, so just pinning the process would probably be not, not be sufficient. And even if we changed the, the code that actually does the RPC communication to use fixed buffers, still just API underneath could fail to work. Um, one of the things we need to do, for example, in this case, um, this is a slide that shows the whole process when an application tries to enter uh, a mount point that is actually uh, a, a secure NFS share, right? So you have point one process walks into the share and the kernel recognizes the mount point is actually handled by the NFS client and passes the, uh, the ball to the NFS client. The NFS client, uh, the only thing it grabs from the user space at this point is the uh, user credentials. It knows that the user ID and what it does, it calls user space because, as we said, it cannot do JSS proxy, uh, sorry, JSS API in kernel. And in this case, it uses RPC NFSD. The client uses a completely different of call method from the server, incidentally, and we haven't changed it uh, yet to use direct JSS proxy protocol. Um, however, it calls RPC NFSD, it passes up the request to find a content and start uh, initialization of the context. We, at that point, accept GSS proxy. So uh, going back to your question about memory pressure cases, RPC NFSD should also be pinned memory at that point. So we already two processes. And the ball, once the ball is in the GSS proxy, uh, uh, what happens is that we also may need to do network communication because if we had no previous credential cache available, we need to go over the network, contact the KDC, and get a new ticket, a new TGT first that we have to save somewhere, normally the file system, and then we have to go to the ticket granted server to get the ticket for the actual user for the NFS server. So I think the short version is make it not swap. You have to pin so much memory that the swap allows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need a local swap file for that. <laughs> It's really a chicken and egg problem. Uh, I think if you want to do swap over the network, you have to be insecure. You cannot use, uh, or at least not use a GIST API. You have to invent a new security mechanism that does not depend on communication. Uh, uh, in reality, it is not that bad because all this happens only the first time the user accesses an NFS server. Once uh, you have the security context back into the NFS client because we exported the context as a lucid context. You don't need this constant communication. So it's not that bad because hopefully your application first goes to the file system and causes all these mechanisms to go in place and then starts using a lot of memory. And so the swap could be work simply because we already have a memory um, a security context available, and all this doesn't need to happen. Sorry. Uh, so, you know, it could work most of the time, except that if the communication between the client and the server happens to fail at the wrong moment and you need to reestablish security context, maybe your credentials expire and you want to rekey, uh, yeah, out of luck.
So, so, so. How do you do UAD to principle mapping? Uh, yes, um, UAD to principle mapping, uh, NFS has its own method. It has a library called LibNFS ID map. We are trying to move a bit away from that. I don't think that's a very important detail for this talk, but uh, in the end, uh, we basically just, uh, in the very simplest case, we do a get PW name using uh, the user principle. Uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but there are uh, helper functions, uh, <coughs> both in GSS API and in FS. Um, I wanted to add just this slide. Uh, we are almost out of time. Um, <coughs> when the whole idea of using GSS proxy for the, for the NFS daemon was the, due to the fact that Active Directory has these large tickets that don't fit the current app call mechanism. And in these large tickets, you find something called PAC, Previous Access Certificate, which is basically authorization information for the user within an MS Active Directory domain. And this information is just number of IDs uh, that are uh, analogous to UIDs and GIDs in the POSIX world. Um, uh, this information is very useful uh, when you are dealing with Active Directory because it basically has all the information about the user available to you when an application contacts your server without having to actually go to Active Directory to ask this information for. So you don't have to use LDAP calls to find the user and to find all its scripts. You already have all the information there. And so we want to, and we do use this in, in the SSD in order to basically do things like trusts where our own server does not have direct access or not easy direct access to the directory server. And we want to grab the pack from the just API communication, there are calls to grab it and use it in the system to create on the fly the user for, for the rebuild domain. The only big problem with that is that the pack is signed with two keys. One is the, K, uh, the KDC key and the other is the service key. And if the application has direct access to the service key, it can basically create a fake pack. And if we just you know, take for granted what's in there, it might just do a privilege escalation. Because uh, you know, an application like HTTP could poison the cache by creating a pack that says the user foo is in all the groups and then user foo can do whatever, maybe around setting binaries or, or not. And so the idea to do to use just uh, yes, as proxy for previous separation is that we grab the pack and we can validate it because the application doesn't have access to the key tab and so cannot fake the pack. And so it also helps us in that situation. Um, we can skip this. The only thing I want to say, we are out of time, please use just yes, API. Uh, a lot of people don't want to because it's not simple, because it's not just a password that goes back and forth but it allows us to do a lot of very interesting things. Uh, so just look at it, it's not too difficult to use. Does this help at all with, like, say, Apache? It does, yeah. it does. So Apache no longer needs to read the key tab. Exactly. Yep, Apache is one of the cases we would like to use, even, for example, in FreeAPA, which is one of the projects I work for. The whole um, management interface is done in an Apache process, and we already do not use any internal credentials to attach, for example, to LDAP to do operations, but we would also like to further separate the actual process from the long-term key using just proxy. Have you built any type of authorization into the proxy to know that the key tab, the Apache user only gets Apache data or <laughs> So what you're saying is that if we do any other se uh, separation, we are out of time, as we can manage. <laughs> 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 do you have any questions you can discuss? No. Yep. Okay. Thank you.